Joining us now is Dr. Shell Nordstrom, co-author of the bestsellers Funky Business and Karaoke Capitalism. Shell, welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. You know, there have been a lot of people who have talked about the fact that America's influence in the world is probably in decline. You know, all the, the great empires eventually all go away. And there are some people who are saying, well, especially this current economic crisis is an indication that America's influence is, is about to go away. I suspect you disagree. Um, yes, can I talk a little bit about that? Yes, I do. <laughs> Uh, have another opinion on that one and yes it's true that all other empires have slowly but surely faded away the Roman Empire the Ottoman Empire the British Empire what have you uh, they all have something in common and that is right before they went down they closed themselves to the rest of the world uh, the Roman Empire was built on the principle that anyone could become a Roman as long as you were willing to follow the Roman laws and the Roman institutions and go along with them but the moment you, st you stop the inflow of talented people, already at that time from the rest of the world, Rome went into stagnation. And this is a conflict for any empire, you know, to keep itself open or should we close ourselves to the rest of the world. It's very tempting to do that and you feel threatened by the rest of the world. But the moment you do that, you also stop the inflow of gifted uh, young men and women that come to your universities and companies and make their contributions. And the US is of course extreme in the sense that so many of the fantastic contributions you have made in many areas are made by people that are first generation immigrants. Might it be Nordstrom or Hilton, the Hilton family from Norway or Sikorsky from Poland, but it's first generation immigrants that came with their ideas, that came with their drive and and that we're willing to share the ideas and ideals of the United States of America. If you stop that inflow, of course it has massive implications for Stanford or Microsoft or what have you, because they are so important. And I would say what has changed since the Roman Empire is that this is even more important today than it was at that time, the inflow. So do you see that inflow continuing in the U.S. Uh, in the next few years? Or do you think we're at a point now where, the, where the America's going to say we're shutting down? Well, we were at that point, I would say, under the uh, former administration. Uh, we all know that, Department of Homeland Security and what have you. And I think the signals from Washington at present is something completely different. I mean, you used to be so welcoming over there, and all of a sudden you were not. We shut the doors. We shut the doors. <laughs> but I think uh, it's opening it again. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm very hopeful on that one. Well, speaking of the rest of the world, we have some countries now like China, India, and Brazil, who are all sort of um, either have become world players in terms of the economy, or are on their way to becoming world players. Um, what do you see as next for them? They are very different, those countries, from each other, Brazil and India and China and Russia. They struggle with their own problems and they have particularities in their history that makes them very, very different from each other. However, uh, one thing they have in common, and that is that they are struggling with an unbelievably uneven distribution of wealth, education, it's pre-1950 in certain areas of, of Russia and China. They hardly know Mao is dead. It's very extreme. Very, very extreme in the countryside. We tend to forget that. And, it's, and we are talking about numbers that are staggering. I mean, it's six to nine hundred million people-ish in the Chinese countryside. That's three times the size of the United States living under awful conditions basically, um, with limited access to information and what have you. Now, we know from history that when you develop a city, a country, a region, if, the, if you do not distribute the wealth in some way that can be accepted by the whole population, you will have unrest and problems. This was actually the initiation of the, uh, how the Russian Revolution began. This uh, created in a way Hitler in, in Germany uh, with 25-29% unemployment at the time. I mean we shouldn't forget that he, he was actually voted democratically and elected by the German people. This means that there are great challenges in those countries to hold 
the countries together and to develop them in such a way that it is acceptable for the population, the whole population of China. And they are under pressure now. The crisis means that the growth is not there to the same extent. It's less, far less, maybe half. And that's a change for Chinese people. They can see that, well, is the government delivering this way they have done? Maybe not. So do you think it's a chance for them to sort of step back and say, you know, now that it's not rampant growth, we can say we're at a reasonable level of growth, so maybe it's time to look at these other issues that are there? I think yes. And they are well, very, the Chinese in particular are very well aware of what unrest can create, because they have had that, they have a very, very long history, as you know, 5,000 years. And as you say, maybe one choice here is to step back a little bit hold back on the, this extremely quick development and start to distribute what we have created a little bit. That might well happen. What's your, what are your thoughts about Africa and where, where does the future lie for, for that continent? Uh, a few years ago it was popular to say that we are exploiting the third world. We are not. We are not doing anything with the third world. That's true. That's the truth. We don't do anything. We don't trade with them we don't visit them. I mean, there are a couple of countries there that you don't see anything. Is on. it a matter of economics or a matter of politics that we're not doing those it's things? It's a matter of massive institutional failure in the case of Africa. There are no institutions in most, in most of those countries that function properly and you cannot start economic and political development without an institutional framework. Africa is very extreme in that sense because Many of the countries are artificially created by the colonial powers, France, Portugal, the UK, um, and they have nothing to do with the, the tribal boundaries and, and the, the, the spirit that might hold an area or a region or a country together. As you know, they are war-torn and it's civil wars in many cases. It's not wars with other countries. It's within the country because they are artificial. So is there any way to change that situation? Does it, can it come from outside of Africa or does it need to happen within Africa itself? It needs to happen within Africa itself but number one we can trade with them and accept the terms of trade rather than impose levies and what have you on, on their exports. Number two is to provide education massive amounts of education for as many people as possible. Number three, uh, this thing with micro-lending, with a little bit of adaptation, it should be possible to transfer that idea also into the African context, and it has made a lot of change in the case of Bangladesh. So there are a couple of things we can do. I'm quite hopeful, actually, Africa slowly, slowly, slowly is moving forward. Shell, final question for you. This morning you had a statement that you made, technology is necessary but not sufficient. Yes. What did you mean by that? I mean that we have created a society where everything we say or put on a piece of paper is instantly distributed to the rest of the world. That has a lot of effects, of course, on science and technology. And one such effect is that on average we tend to know more or less the same things at the same time. But that makes sense, I mean, given all the technology we have. This means that science and technology also becomes necessary for creating a competitive company, but not sufficient. Science is not enough. You have to add something to science. Uh, iPod it's a very old technology, actually. It's, it's a German technology from the beginning, originally, from Fraunhof Institute in Berlin. It's 16 years, 20, almost 20 years old, the technology. But Apple was able to add something to that technology. The size, the design, functionality. I mean, it shows that even this, this technological breakthrough that, that, that those chips were at the time, it's not enough. And I, I also think that that points in a very particular direction. It points at you and me, the human being, as the key to success in our time, not the technology. 
Great. Well, Shell, thank you so much for being with us and for sharing some very visionary insights. Thank you.